Tonight, Ontario Mohawks have been given a deadline. There should be no one around here. Clear their rail blockade tonight or risk charges. A huge spike in coronavirus cases around the world. Is the virus spreading faster than we can contain it? That's absolutely ridiculous. Disturbing allegations against an Alberta nursing home, leaving residents in wet, soiled diapers. From a former Zamboni driver to a star goalie. Someone came into the room and like, hey, you better get dressed, today. you're going out there. So I was a little shocked, but I'm loving it. The Ontario man living the NHL dream, at least for one night. This is The National. Good evening, I'm Susan Ormiston. Ian is away tonight. Things are coming to a head at a key rail blockade in Ontario that's choking the economy and supply lines. Police have given them a midnight deadline to clear out or face investigation by morning. And this could bring the first major development since the protests began more than two weeks ago. Olivia Stefanovic is there. Upping the pressure, the Mohawks of Tyne Denega face an ultimatum tear it all down or face charges. The Mohawks made their own recording, complete with CN's conditions. So, so the offer is if everyone vacates the property, CN's property tonight, that CN uh, is not going to pursue charges. I have morals and ethics, and I know what, you, what Canada's doing is wrong. Now one of the Mohawks who has been here since the beginning worries about what might come. I always felt that we get we <clears throat> they were close to solving it peacefully. Um, the question is whether the people that come are peaceful. Protest camps sprang up in solidarity with Wet'suwet'en hereditary chiefs who oppose a natural gas pipeline and want the RCMP out of their territory. The Mohawks set that same condition for ending their demonstration, which has been hurting the economy and disrupting supply lines for 18 days. We run a manufacturing company in Kingston and we need propane for it. And it's our fear that in the next few days, we probably run out of gas and we'll have to lay off 200 people. Outside of the territory, business owners are fed up. I don't accept that argument that Canadian laws do not apply to them. I say as long as you hold a Canadian passport, you use Canadian currency, you are a part of Canada and it's a part of uh, being a part of Canada. All the laws apply to you. So, Olivia, the deadline is now set. What's the scene there tonight? Well, there's no sign of a raid tonight here. No buildup of police up the road or a tactical unit, but the camp behind me remains on edge until somebody makes a move, Susan. All right, thank you very much. Olivia Stevanovich in Tyendinaga. Over the weekend, two more blockades sprang up in direct defiance of the Prime Minister, who declared on Friday they must all come down. The uh, peaceful barricade went up yesterday at noon, and so we plan to be here as long as it takes for the RCMP to withdraw from Wet'suwet'en territories. Organizers of this Saskatoon protest say trains have been slowing down since they set up in Vancouver. Protesters gathered today at this major crossing. But this one demonstration in Quebec did disperse late Friday night as riot police stood by. The heart of this national crisis is the Wet'suwet'en territory in BC, where some hereditary chiefs are trying to stop a natural gas pipeline. The rail blockades began earlier this month when RCMP began clearing out protest camps along an access road. And as Karen Pauls shows us, the RCMP presence remains a major hurdle to negotiating any solution. Photos, demands for identification. Anti-pipeline protesters say this is what happens whenever they're stopped by RCMP on the access road to the pipeline construction site. Why is someone uh, shining a flashlight in the window right now? Oh, I think he's just making sure that everyone's safe. They're recording the encounters as proof of what they call unlawful harassment as police continue their patrols as part of a court order. Just down this road is where the RCMP had their temporary outpost until last Thursday. That's when they got the phone call saying move out. I'm told they packed up everything they needed for their daily operations, closed up those ATCO trailers and locked the gate. 
About a half hour drive away, nearly two dozen officers now work out of this garage at the detachment in Houston. So this footage was taken on the 22nd. Carla um, Tate says RCMP have stepped up patrols since they left that temporary command post and it has to stop. Our chiefs have been clear from the outset that nation to nation discussions don't occur at the end of a gun. Some hereditary chiefs are returning from visiting rail blockades in Ontario and Quebec. They'll meet tomorrow to talk about their next steps, including a possible meeting with the RCMP and, depending on how that goes, one with the federal government. We can't have a discussion while we're under duress. We can settle with them patrolling once a day with accompaniment of one of our nation members. But there are people here who support the pipeline. Bonnie Ward is a former Wet'suwet'en band counselor who used to work for Coastal Gas Link. She doesn't like the approach of the hereditary chiefs. They, with people, they should be consulting with their own people. So we're going to tell industry where and how to protect it. That's how we get involved. Back on the access road, Darren Percella is delivering homemade chicken noodle soup to the camp at the 44 kilometer mark. It feels like good deeds and support of life. He says blockades and protests may be disrupting life in Canada, but they're also raising awareness of Indigenous rights. Karen Pauls, CBC News, near Houston, B.C. Now to the future of a controversial oil sands project. Tech Resources is pulling its application for the proposed Frontier Oil Sands Mine. It's located north of Fort McMurray. It would have been one of the largest oil sands projects ever. It had already passed a lengthy regulatory review and the federal government was under pressure to make a decision this week about whether it could proceed. On the one hand, the promise of thousands of jobs. On the other, fierce opposition from environmental groups. Host of Power and Politics, Vashi Capellas joins us now from Ottawa. Vashi, what is behind this decision? A couple of things, Susan. I now have in my hands a letter from the CEO of this company to Federal Environment Minister Jonathan Wilkinson. And it's a fairly lengthy letter in which the CEO goes over basically this conundrum that we've spoken about so often on this program and on CBC News between resource development and climate change policies. And he specifically, I want to bring up a board, and one of these quotes says, the nature of our business, Don Lindsay says, dictates that a vocal minority will almost inevitably oppose specific developments. We're prepared to face that sort of opposition. Frontier, however, has surfaced as a broader debate over climate change and Canada's role in addressing it, essentially saying we've become this litmus test for this sort of uh, tension between uh, resource development and climate policy, and as a result, we don't think it's tenable. There are also questions about the economic viability of the project. The CEO had talked about that before, but definitely those are the reasons put forth in this letter today. Yeah, Vashi, pretty interesting letter from the CEO. What is the political reaction likely to be? The Premier has spoken, Premier of Alberta, Jason Kenney, has spoken with the Prime Minister. I'm told that Premier Kenney is furious. He also put out a statement today saying that the decision is disappointing. But in light of the events of the last few weeks, it is not surprising. Premier Kenney is pinning the blame for this entire thing at the federal government's feet, saying essentially that they have created the uh, atmosphere or the conditions in which something like this would happen. Uh, he's pointing also to the blockades as evidence of the kind of uh, protests and things that can stop a project like this from going forward. Now, I should point out, though, that there's a lot in this letter from the CEO that highlights a support of a more robust climate change, for example, of pricing on carbon. So there's a lot of critics of Premier Kenny coming out saying, well, this points to a lack of climate policy on your end, too. I think what this will end up being is a very, very, very tense political discussion over the next couple of days, Susan. Indeed. Lots more on that tomorrow. Thanks very much, Vachi. Now to the latest on coronavirus. Canada has recorded a 10th case. A woman arriving from China was tested in a Toronto hospital. Considered a low risk to the public, she's now at home in self-isolation with mild symptoms. And while Canada's infection rate so far remains low, overseas, well, it's a much different story. With infections in over 30 countries, the overwhelming majority in China, of big concern now are sudden spikes in three countries in particular. South Korea is now on red alert with six deaths and more than 760 cases, hundreds of those connected to a church in the city of Daeju. 
Iran has some 43 cases, though some fear the count is actually much higher. With eight deaths, it now has the second highest fatality rate outside China. And Italy is now by far the most infected country in Europe, with over 150 cases, at least three of them fatal. And with these localized outbreaks, growing fear of a global pandemic. Tina Lovegreen looks at the accelerating efforts to prevent that. Streets deserted and shops shut down. In northern Italy, dozens of towns are under lockdown as the country takes unprecedented steps to curb the spread of the virus that has the whole continent on edge. At one point, Austria had temporarily halted all rail traffic to Italy. And tensions are high as residents scramble to stock up on food under the watchful eye of police. We're also patrolling streets and carrying out checks at the borders. In nearby Venice, even before the famed carnival was cut short, masks were a common sight. In Milan, fashion shows went on without an audience. And in a country where soccer is king, empty stadiums. The outbreak of the disease outside of China is worrisome, says the World Health Organization. I think that the pendulum is, is rapidly swinging toward containment not being a viable option as we're seeing more and more cases pop up throughout the world. There are similar fears in Iran, where the virus has killed more people than anywhere outside of China sparking public fear, shortages and doubts that officials can contain the virus. Iran's neighbours are also concerned. Pakistan, Turkey, Armenia and Afghanistan have all closed their borders. And in South Korea, the nation with the second highest infection rate, officials are doing everything they can to keep people calm urging residents to stay home unless it's absolutely necessary and banning mass gatherings. And I really think this is time for uh, medical teams and public health teams to, uh, to really prepare for either more imported cases, but also for locally acquired cases as well. The challenge now, containing fear as well as the outbreak. Tina Lovegreen, CBC News, Vancouver. Four British former passengers of the Diamond Princess cruise ship have tested positive for COVID-19 in the UK, while a third person, an elderly Japanese man, has died now. Hundreds of Canadians spent a grueling two weeks in quarantine aboard that vessel. Anita Bath has the latest on some who made it home and some who didn't. Rose and Greg Yerricks are among dozens of Canadians left behind in Japan, waiting it out in a clinic. Reading books doing Sudoku and trying to stay sane. They both have coronavirus, but feel perfectly fine. There's 200 of us here in this facility mm -hmm. that tested positive but are asymptomatic. The Erickses, though, are stuck there until they test negative twice. And they go all the way up the nostril, all the way up, you know, as far as they can reach. And almost, I think they're going into the sinus cavity. It's extremely uncomfortable. Uh, what specifically happens after that in terms of where we go, I really don't know for sure. And back in this country, 129 Canadians who tested negative and flew home on Friday are now quarantined at this hotel complex in Cornwall, Ontario. Three meals a day, a well-balanced meal and they would drop it off at the door and they would just knock on the door and say, oh, your meal's here. Relief to be on Canadian soil, but there's still fear. Everything sent to my room, I will clean it and clean it and clean it again before I would drink it, yeah. you know, like if, uh, or eat it. They were allowed outside. Counseling is available and the chows say necessary. I cannot sleep at all. That's probably what is the aftermath of the whole thing. Other cruise ship passengers have also returned home. Four UK evacuees tested positive after landing. The same goes for a group of American passengers who flew home. More than 600 people from the Diamond Princess have coronavirus, the largest cluster outside China, leaving passengers to wonder if they could have been evacuated sooner. I have a question for our Canadian government. What are they going to do for the people that is left behind? People like the Yerikses, as they face that unknown, they're comforted by the strangers looking out for them. Anita Bath, CBC News, Vancouver. 
And one last note on all this tonight. Air Canada has confirmed that a woman believed to be BC's sixth coronavirus case was aboard its Valentine's Day flight from Montreal to Vancouver. The airline says it is informing anyone affected. Turning to U.S. politics, Bernie Sanders has picked up more momentum in the Democratic presidential race with a commanding lead in this weekend's Nevada caucus. And as Paul Hunter tells us, that's made Sanders a target for his rivals. Campaigning today in Texas, Bernie Sanders seemed more energized than ever. Let us beat Trump. Let us transform this country. Thank you all very much. Now with the most votes in three straight states in the battle among Democrats for who will take on Donald Trump for the White House. We had three additions for Biden, right? Yesterday, in the Nevada caucuses, Sanders not only came in first, but did so comfortably with support across age groups and ethnic backgrounds. And significantly, strong backing from voters whose stated aim is simply finding a candidate to beat Trump. We have now won the Nevada caucus. But for those now deeming Sanders unstoppable, a reminder, it's still early days. Jesus came, nobody. Today, one-time frontrunner Joe Biden, who came second last night, albeit distantly, was in South Carolina, long seen as a Biden stronghold. It's home to the next Democratic primary next Saturday. A reset? or Biden's last stand. I'm gonna do well there, and I'll do well there, and I'll do well beyond there as well. Biden and fellow Democrats Pete Buttigieg and Amy Klobuchar are among those who regularly underline that Sanders, a self-described democratic socialist, is too radical for most American voters, and that if pitted against Trump, Trump would thrash him. In the past, he's labeled Sanders a communist. We'll see what happens, but I congratulate Bernie Sanders, and if it's going to be him, he certainly has a substantial lead. Say some, Trump can't wait to campaign against him. As Democrats, still divided, still choosing, but now leaning Sanders, wonder, where does all of this go from here? Paul Hunter, CBC News, Washington. Canadian fashion executive Peter Nygaard is facing more allegations of sexual assault involving young women and girls. They're part of an investigation published today in the New York Times. Now in his late 70s, Peter Nygaard has spent decades cultivating a glittering image. Beginning in Winnipeg, he made himself Canada's top fashion supplier and one of the country's wealthiest businessmen. It's brought him the good life, including a luxury estate in the Bahamas. And then, last week, 10 women filed a suit against Nygaard, alleging he sexually assaulted them. Many claimed they were lured to his estate by the promise of jobs and a taste of that luxury. But Nygaard's lawyers insist the lawsuit is all part of a conspiracy led by his neighbor, American billionaire Louis Bacon. The CBC's Fifth Estate has also been looking into the Nygaard allegations. Bob McEwen is here. Bob, what does the story in the New York Times today say? Susan, when these uh, lawsuits were filed in New York last week, they represented 10 women who say they were raped or sexually assaulted by Peter Nygaard from 2008 through 2015, when six of them were 14 or 15 years old. The Times story today was the product of dozens of interviews over months of research and described allegations of years of sexual assault and abuse by Nygaard in the Bahamas, in Canada, in the U.S., including at least nine other women who have sued him or reported him to the police. And the stories in the Bahamas are very similar to those in the lawsuits, claiming he targeted disadvantaged young women and children, lured them with offers of money and modeling jobs, drugged or intimidated them into sex, and kept files about his favorites. We should say the CBC has not independently verified the allegations in today's story by the Times. Now, the story talks about a so-called feud between he and a neighbor in the Bahamas. Mm -hmm. How does that connect to the rape case? Yeah, when the lawsuits were announced last week and, and today after the Times story, Peter Nygaard has aggressively denied any wrongdoing, claiming he's the victim of a smear campaign orchestrated by his neighbor, American billionaire Louis Bacon. Nygaard insists all those complainants were paid to lie, to destroy his reputation. And indeed, the Times story does uncover payments to a number of women who've accused Nygaard of sexual misconduct, including two 
who have since recanted their stories. Now, Nygaard says this is evidence they and others were paid to lie about him. He claims he has never acted improperly towards a woman. For Bacon's part, he denies the smear campaign, though he admits financially supporting the group that helps women who've claimed sexual abuse by Peter Nygaard. Bacon says when he heard their stories, he had to do something. And again, we should say none of these allegations against Nygaard have yet been tested in court. Now, Bob, the civil litigation so far we've heard about, but is there any criminal litigation against him? Yeah, we understand the U.S. Homeland Security Department and the FBI have previously been involved. We understand also that there is a criminal investigation in the Bahamas. And just today, the Bahamian Minister of National Security announced a police investigation into whether or not Peter Nygaard bribed local law enforcement to turn a blind eye to this case. Hmm. All right, thanks, Bob. Bob McEwen, host of the CBC's Fifth Estate. We should also point out that Peter Nygaard continues to sue the CBC over a Fifth Estate documentary in 2010. And a Canadian who was revered for his humanitarian work is alleged to have sexually abused several women over three decades. That is the conclusion from a report commissioned by the Catholic charity which he founded. The mentally deficient are the people who have no voice in our land. And I think that there have to be people who can speak for them. <laughs> Jean Vanier created the nonprofit L'Arche to serve adults with intellectual disabilities. He died last year at the age of 90. And according to the report, Vanier engaged in abusive sex relationships with at least six women under the guise of providing spiritual guidance. Now to a scathing complaint against staff at an Alberta nursing home owned by one of the country's biggest operators. It alleges that administrators locked away diapers while incontinent residents sat in waste-soaked pads, causing infections, rashes and open wounds. Erica Johnson has this Go Public investigation. Don Bryan says he's still haunted by how his mother suffered as a resident at this nursing home for four years. Sheila Bryan developed repeated bladder and yeast infections, was in so much discomfort, says her son, she scratched her skin raw. It was frustrating and, and angry, like, I, I, you know, to stand there and to watch. He blames poor hygiene practices, says his mother was often left in wet diapers. He's one of five people who filed complaints against two senior staff at Extendicare Athabasca, claiming practices at the for-profit nursing home came at the expense of quality care. A complaint filed by a former nurse describes how diapers were rationed, locked away so health care aides had difficulty accessing extra when needed. In an email obtained by GoPublic, the director of care tells staff she's changing the access code to the room storing the diapers. The new code is not to be shared with health care aides, she writes, because product removal was being abused. That's absolutely ridiculous. You know, how can you ration someone when they go to the washroom? You have no control over that. The complaint says diaper wipes were rationed too, one per change, and washing the groin area with soap and water discouraged. Statistics show that during that period, the nursing home had a urinary tract infection rate of 7.5%, much higher than the national average. A healthcare advocacy organization says standards of care vary from province to province. So this is again why we're calling for some national standards that uh, would apply to all long-term care facilities across the country so that residents know that they could be relying um, on these facilities to treat them with dignity and respect. Don Bryan says he's waiting for a decision on the complaint he filed, hoping for some kind of justice, he says, for his mother. So Eric has some very disturbing allegations there. What does the nursing home say? Well, we asked Extend to Care for an interview and it declined. It did send us a statement and it said that it disagreed with many of the allegations, that the diapers were only kept locked away during a brief time due to a personnel issue. And also it pointed out that the home passed its most recent government audit. Mm. So a lot of people, of course, have loved ones in nursing homes. What should they be looking out for? 
Well, incontinent products are important, so ask if they are rationed or if they are locked away. Also ask uh, how often baths are given in a home because there's a mandated amount. Ask what the actual number is that's delivered. Find out what the staff resident ratio is and what the home does if there's an understaffing issue. And lastly, if you have any concerns, document, document. Take pictures, send emails to the supervisor. Make sure you can get as much as you can in writing or in video or photographs. Yeah, very important. Thanks so much, Erica. Good to talk to you. If you have a story you want investigated, email Erica and her team at gopublic at cbc.ca. Harvey Weinstein's case ignited the Me Too movement. I hope in 2020 the Me Too movement accelerates. Up next, as we wait for a verdict in his trial, three Canadian women share their own stories and where they want Me Too to go next. And a dramatic rescue in the woods. The week-long search that ended thanks to this furry volunteer. But first, a memorable NHL debut for a former Zamboni driver. I didn't sleep much last night, that's for sure. How an emergency backup goalie got his big league win. We're back in a few moments. When Dave Ayers woke up yesterday, he was a 42-year-old dad from Whitby, Ontario, who'd already survived a kidney transplant. Today, well, he's a legend in the NHL. Ayers was at last night's Toronto Carolina game as the emergency backup goalie. Magda Gebersalasi tells us what happened next. <laughs> It's an ending fit for Hollywood, an unlikely hockey hero and his history-making moment. When I saw the text message, I, these guys playing with me right now? Like, I'm going in? Last night, 42-year-old David Ayers, a married father of three with a day job, made his NHL debut. The Toronto Maple Leafs were facing the Carolina Hurricanes, and Ayers was the emergency backup goalie on site. In the second period, the emergency came. The Hurricanes up 3-1 were suddenly down their two goalies with injuries and Ayers was called in. These guys were awesome. They said to me, just have fun with it. Don't worry about how many goals go in. Just enjoy it. And he did. The Leafs scored two goals on him. But he still made save after save. And Ayers makes a lovely save. Eight in total. Faces a shot, makes the save. Keep the puck, David. Oh, man, look at that reaction. With him in the net, the Hurricanes secured a 6-3 win, and Ayers made history as the oldest goaltender to win in his NHL debut. Today, he was back on the ice in his regular role as a practice goalie for the Leafs, but he's still basking in his big moment. I didn't sleep much last night, that's for sure. T-shirts with his name are up for sale, and fans are singing his praises. Amazing. Yeah, awesome. he did really well. Yeah. Yeah. Better than Anderson. <laughs> his wife couldn't be more proud. She says hockey is his first love, and not even a kidney transplant 15 years ago could keep him away from it. He's that guy that won't ever give up, and he does everything he can to better himself. When asked whether he thinks he'll get another shot at the NHL, you never know, you know, I'm getting up in the ages and stuff like that, but if there is one, I'll take it. So what's next for this hero goalie? Well, he'll be joining his winning team once again. The Carolina Hurricanes have invited him to be a guest at Tuesday's game against Dallas. Magda Gebrasalasa, CBC News, Toronto. When we come back, speaking up after Me Too. I was abused and raped and threatened. We hear from three Canadians their message ahead of the Harvey Weinstein verdict. And later, a couple lost in the woods for a week meet the team behind a remarkable rescue. The jury in the Harvey Weinstein trial goes back to its deliberations tomorrow morning and a verdict may be imminent if the jurors can find a way out of Friday's deadlock. The former Hollywood producer is charged on five counts including first degree rape and predatory sexual assault. He faces up to life in prison. The allegations against Weinstein set off a torrent of talk about sexual assault and harassment, women sharing long, hidden, painful experiences. And that all evolved into what we know now as the Me Too movement. So we wanted to dip into that conversation again. 
with three Canadian women, all survivors of sexual assault. Here they are in their own words. <laughs> Here's me at 14, so excited to go to this incredible school and, and, and have one of the best musical educations in the world. And, and instead, I was abused and raped and threatened. And I eventually had to leave a full scholarship school at age 17 because I had to get out of there. You have to share the lunch room, for example, with 10 other men where their conversation, most of the time, are around how they have sex with women, what kind of woman they prefer in the bed. So on my first day of work, I was greeted by this person. Uh, he basically stared me up and down um, in a very intimidating way and asked me, who the fuck are you? I'm Laura St. John. I'm a classical violinist. I was abused at 14 by my violin teacher. My name is Serendira Bravo, and I was fired after refusing to sleep with my boss. My name is Charlotte, and I was sexually harassed and assaulted while I was a waitress in a sports bar. I was accepted at the Curtis Institute of Music in Philadelphia when I was 13 years old. His name was Yasha Brodsky, um, and he was 78 years old. I was 14, and he threatened me with kicking my brother out of the school as well as myself unless I acquiesced to what he wanted me to do, which included sexual abuse and eventually rape. I am from Mexico. I came to Canada 15 years ago, like many other immigrants trying to look for a better life. I get trapped in jobs, in a precarious jobs, uh, construction, factories, cleaning, uh, most of them always uh, in, with a minimum wage or less than the minimum wage. In general, in most of the places that I work in construction for those 13 years, it was very similar experience. Is this common practice of the supervisors to ask for sex favors to, to the few women that work uh, there? When I moved to Alberta, I was putting myself through school and uh, working part-time jobs. I was getting along with my other coworkers and um, other people that worked uh, behind the bar, and this person I felt was in a sense targeting me, pushing me over, uh, knocking over my drinks or my cutlery, putting it on the floor or you know, pulling my hair or walking by and slapping my ass and laughing about it. And I pulled my manager aside and he said that, you know, this person is friends with the higher ups of the workplace and uh, my hands are tied. There's not much I can do. I think actually that the aftermath and the fallout is worse than the bomb. It was worse for me to tell people what happened to me, almost, than it was what happened to me. After working with them uh, several months, I get so tired of those kind of uh, harassment, and I come out as a lesbian and I told them, like, please stop, I, I'm never going on a, a date with you. The supervisor answered me that I was a lesbian because I never met a, a good guy who showed me how good could be the sex with the men. That situation was awful, and one week later, uh, they fired me. I called the owner of the company, I report the incident, and the owner of the company told me that was no more job for me, so I have to stay at home. So on the day of the incident, he went behind me and started pouring my drinks down the sink. I snapped. I had enough of it. I had enough of the treatment. I went to meet with the upper management uh, to discuss this issue. And I didn't feel safe. And I didn't feel like I should have to not work, not leave my apartment, suffer in my, my wages because of this person. I am very lucky that I continued in my profession. A lot of fellow survivors that I know have left music because of that. I hope in 2020 the Me Too movement accelerates exponentially because I think that's kind of what's been happening, you know, from 2017, 18, 19. And I hope more and more women are able to band together and, and some men and, and just put an end to this abuse. In schools and in all walks of life, abuse is very, very common and justice is not. And for me, I'll never get justice because 
the man who raped me at, when I was 14, continued teaching for another 11 years until he died, and he died happily in his bed. And I don't want that for other women. I want them to be able to see justice. I have it too many other friends that came through the same problems. I decided to start organizing with them what could be a best way to protect ourselves, talking with other women and men about those experiences and how we can organize together trying to find the, the, the life that we really deserve. I feel like we're making waves. I feel like people know that it's, it's starting to change. And you know what, women have put up with way too much for too long and we've been too nice. I need to heal from this too and I need to move on and I need to let other people know that you can heal from this too. And we should mention that the Curtis Institute of Music, where Laura St. John attended school, says it is currently reviewing all allegations of sexual misconduct on campus. Yasha Brodsky died 16 years before this review began, and he was never charged by police. While the Me Too movement got people talking about sexual violence and harassment, what has actually changed in schools or in workplaces? Well, one of the people working towards changing the culture is Farrah Khan. She's a sexual violence support worker and a member of the Federal Strategy Against Gender-Based Violence Advisory Council. Hi, Farrah. Hi. So we are hearing a lot about Me Too, but what are some of the misconceptions you hear about the whole idea? Well, there's misconceptions that it's a movement to, you know, get men or get people who commit sexual harassment. And really, actually, it's a movement to heighten and allow for the voices of survivors to be heard and feel supported and know that it's not their fault. But you do hear people saying, oh, I can't say anything or, right. you know, there's no way of getting around this. They're going to be after me. How do you address that kind of backlash? I think you remind people that we want to have people telling our, their stories of sexual harassment, that their stories are important and they should be heard. And that if you feel uncomfortable as if someone's going to challenge the way you've been treating people in the workplace, then maybe you need to do some self-reflection. Because the piece is here is we're not policing the way people act or the way people are. We're asking for people to commit to safe workplaces, to commit that sexual harassment will no longer be allowed in the workplace. And that is a commitment we should all be making. And a lot we hear about are high-profile people in some mm -hmm. cases, certainly in the Weinstein case. But what we've just shown is that that women all over are experiencing this kind of pattern. Absolutely, and in those stories that we saw, that's really about abuse of power. Those are people that experience sexual harassment by people oftentimes that were in a position where they had power over them, be it a teacher or an employer. And in any of those situations, we have to recognize that people should be able to be safe and be able to be heard when that violence happens. In those cases, though, they went to their supervisors yes. ultimately. They reported it like we say women should, and they were penalized. Mm -hmm. So how do you change that culture within a workplace or a school? Well, I think it's systemic. It, we can't just treat it like there's one bad apple, like a bad manager or somebody that just didn't listen. We have to treat it systemically. So that means ensuring that we have strong policies, govern, our government has strong legislation around this, and also ensuring that people are trained in it. And not just a 15-minute presentation where you come in and talk for five minutes, but actually a long-standing tradition of having trainings throughout the year, and also ensuring that people know that if they go to their manager, their manager has a responsibility to report it and to be investigated. And just very briefly, do you think the Me Too movement has had a lasting impact? Absolutely. I think it's had a lasting ap impact to make people safe to say that it's something happened to them and that people have to take action and no longer do people have to suffer in silence. We have to keep pushing for it because it's still not enough. All right, Farrah Khan, thank you very much. Farrah Khan is a sexual violence support worker and educator. And still ahead, uh, breaking the stigma. The time for silence about suicide is over. The change maker behind the Toronto Transit Commission's new suicide prevention strategy. That's next. We first introduced you to John O'Grady last fall. The Toronto Transit Commission's chief safety officer gave the national unprecedented access to the city's subway system to shatter the stigma around suicide on its tracks. 
Tonight, we're hearing from him again about why the TTC changed its suicide prevention strategy and how it's inspired others to do the same thing. It's all part of a new series on The National about people making a difference. Here's Joanna Romiliotis with our first Changemaker. The time for silence about suicide is over. Suicide by subway. For decades, it was a quiet crisis. Then John O'Grady started talking and started saving lives. We needed a new approach. We needed to break down that silence and, and open it up a discussion. And we're really glad we did. Why are you glad? Well, the numbers have dropped by half this year, approximately. And once we started talking about it, we found there's a lot of other groups in society that, that can help us and have offered to help us. It wasn't an easy decision to tackle suicide openly because of the fear it could trigger copycats. But to O'Grady, suicide by subway is a public act and takes a public toll. There's all the TTC employees, and it's not just the supervisors, it's the, uh, it's the train operators, obviously, it's the track crew that have to be involved with the cleanup, it's the car house operators who have to clean the train afterwards, and everybody in between. So it just ripples out across the whole of society, and dozens or maybe hundreds of people are affected by every suicide that happens in the subway. He's carrying a picture frame. Mm -hmm. And so he spends a lot of time staring at the picture frame. The shift included going public with the human stories behind the statistics. train is incoming. Like these captured on TTC cameras. For O'Grady, it was personal too. We've all been touched. My family's been touched by suicide. I've seen what it does inside a family. And so it's really important just to remember. There's no stereotype. You know, these can be young kids that are having trouble at school or maybe they're being bullied or they could be grandmothers. We've, you know, they could be elderly people in wheelchairs and everybody in between, so. Why was it important for you to humanize these people and these statistics? We can talk about the numbers. They're either going up or they're going down, but the numbers really don't motivate anybody to do anything. It's a human life, a person with a family and something that could have been avoided and can be prevented in the future. The strategy, be open, offer hope. 135A, go ahead. And help. Employees are trained to intervene. And recently, the TTC asked the public to step in too. Ultimately, what do you want employees and down the road commuters to do when they see people in distress? Talk to them. It's as simple as that. Just talk to them, ask them if they need something. Do they need help? Is there anything that we can do for them? Yeah, I've seen that work really, really well in places like Singapore yeah, and China. There is a tangible solution too, physical barriers. O'Grady launched a new feasibility study. Platform edge doors seem to be the answer, but how far off are they? It would be a, a very costly and very technically difficult project to do to retrofit the subway. It can be done. It's been done elsewhere. What does it come down to for you? I think the community has to tell our politicians that this is a priority. It's a more of a priority than building very fancy subway stations, say, or it's more of a priority than, uh, than extending the line. O'Grady just retired and says the conversation must continue. You are a pioneer in this field. How do you feel about being the face of such an open conversation? I I'm quite proud of it. Uh, we're seeing other, other transit agencies are, are looking at what we're doing. The London Underground's developed a training program that's not dissimilar to ours. We helped Chicago set up their program, BART, Bay Area Rapid Transit in San Francisco. So uh, other transit agencies are noticing and... Uh, Would you consider yourself a change maker? I've been working on this project for 20 years, so <laughs> it's slow change. But yeah, I think we have moved the needle here for the transit industry. And now I think the transit industry is coming around to saying, yeah, there is something we can do and we should. Joanna Rumeliotis, CBC News, Toronto. Pretty impressive. Stay with us. The moment is coming up.
A Valentine's Day hike for a California couple, well, it turned into a harrowing eight days in the woods. They went hiking and got lost. Their family had nearly given up hope, but they were found yesterday alive thanks to volunteers and a dog named Groot. That's our moment. So we were searching up the drainage from shallow beach. About halfway up, we hear voices. First we thought it was another team, but then they started yelling help. We looked at each other and we're like, that's them. We rushed over to them, got on the radio, requested more resources, and ultimately the Sonoma One Sheriff Rescue Helicopter uh, extricated them along with our team. Um, and in speaking with Carol and Ian, the reason they are most likely alive is because they uh, were drinking from a puddle that they found near where they were uh, located. They just uh, said how grateful they were. They were like, thank God you found us. We're so happy. Pretty amazing. Wow. That is the National for February 23rd. Thanks for joining us. Good night.